Well, welcome to Strategic Vision 2020 with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. I'm Stan Grant. And today we're discussing China. China has loomed large over every single conversation that we've had. There is no doubt that the rise of China was going to be the defining geopolitical, economic, strategic question of the 21st century, particularly the relationship of China and the United States. And we've seen the rhetoric certainly ramping up on both sides in recent times. Australia has uh, increased its defence uh, spending and its defence posture, um, not, uh, uh, not saying directly as a result of China, but certainly that is a big factor. Um, we've seen the Australian Foreign Minister and Defence Minister in the United States just this past week, uh, and, uh, and again, joining in the United States in pushing back against China, particularly China's more assertive stance in the South China Sea. There is so much to discuss about the rise of China, what it means for the world. And to do that, I'm joined by Elizabeth Economy, longtime China watcher, has a terrific new book out as well called Xi Jinping's Third Revolution. Elizabeth, good to have you with us. Um, I, I wanted to start on that, actually, and that question of the Third Revolution. If the first revolution was a Communist Party revolution, Mao's revolution, if the second revolution was Deng Xiaoping and the opening up of China, the reform of China, What's the third? So the third revolution, according to Xi Jinping, because he really set this notion out uh, in, in a way in his speech uh, back in 2017, when he was reselected as general secretary of the Communist Party for his second five-year term. And he said, you know, China has stood up, which was the Mao revolution yeah. that you mentioned, that China has grown rich, and that was the Deng uh, revolution. And now that China has become strong is, and is moving towards center stage. And that's Xi's revolution. Uh, so it is about China reclaiming uh, a degree of centrality on the global stage, uh, becoming strong at home uh, and with a much more ambitious and expansive sense of its own place on the global stage. And he made this very clear, didn't he, from the moment that he took power. I was working for CNN at the time based in Beijing. And I remember the day that he came out onto the stage and I remember the day that he introduced the, the new Politburo. Um, and he talked about it very specifically in terms of a a China dream, the greatest dream for the Chinese nation in modern history. What is the, the Xi China dream? So I, I think um, the Chinese dream for Xi Jinping, you know, at home is really about having a robust Chinese Communist Party at the forefront of the political system. Uh, it's about having an economy that is has moved away from simply being the world's manufacturing center to being an innovative economy so that China can become a, a prosperous uh, sort of advanced industrialized country by 2049, 2050. Uh, and it's about having, as he said, a PLA that is capable of fighting and winning wars. Uh, so I think that's China at home. And on, on the global stage, I think what he's talking about is China reclaiming uh, what it considers to be its sovereign uh, territory. So looking at the South China Sea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Uh, I think it's about China's extending its influence uh, through things like the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and about China changing norms uh, in global governance. Uh, so working in the United Nations and other international institutions so that norms around things like human rights or internet governance uh, align more closely with those of China. Uh, so I think it really is quite an ambitious agenda that he has set out uh, for himself. Uh, but since he's uh, eliminated the two-term limit on the presidency, he's got you know mm. a long time to be able to get through that agenda. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's talk about that um, and, and what a move that was. That if effectively he declares himself president for life. I mean, you take on a sort of role almost as an emperor. He's seen as the most powerful leader since Mao. You could even say he's more powerful because China in fact, is in a more powerful position than it was during during Mao's time. What does this tell us about the man himself? Because the psychology of Xi, who Xi Jinping is, is very much tied, isn't it, to what he wants for his country? Yeah, you know, I, I think of, um, so Xi, I think as you're suggesting, he has amassed an enormous amount of power in his own hands. Uh, more power, I think, than any individual leader since Mao Zedong. Um, you know, and he's done this by uh, taking control of a lot of the most important committees and commissions uh, that oversee big areas of Chinese policy. Uh, he has his anti-corruption campaign, uh, which has 
been very robust. You know, every year detaining, arresting more uh, officials than the year before. I think 2018, it was over 620,000 officials. The year before that, it was somewhere about 520,000 officials. Um, you know, his elimination of the two-term limit on the presidency. So uh, he's taken all this power in his own hands, but he's a lot about control. And I think if you look at the policies that he's put in place um, domestically, uh, both in the political realm and even in the economy, uh, it's about exerting control, reasserting the power of the Communist Party back into Chinese society, back into the economy. Uh, so, you know, now one of the big debates, one of the big issues that we have with China, you know, is how do you distinguish a Chinese private enterprise from a Chinese mm. state-owned enterprise at a time when Xi Jinping has put his fingers into everything? Right. And we know that the Communist Party now uh, is engaged in all Chinese companies. Right. They have to be responsive to the demands of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think that's a lot about who Xi Jinping is. It's about a lot of control. It's a fascinating personal story, too. Of course, his father was uh, sat at the right hand of Mao, but then was purged from the party, was seen as a traitor to the nation. Xi Jinping, during the Cultural Revolution, was sent down. He was sent out to the rural areas. Why did someone who saw what the Chinese Communist Party could do at its worst, and indeed to his own family, double down on the strength of that party. You know, I, I think if, if you look at that moment, you know, when he was a young man and living in that village, first of all, he ran away from the village mm. right at the outset. He didn't want to be there, so it's like, I'm going home. So he tried to get back home, but that didn't work out so well. So back to the village he goes. And uh, what's interesting to me, frankly, is, is that when he applied to become a member of the Communist Party, it took him 10 tries, uh, apparently, before he was able to become a member, you know, in part because of his father, in part, you know, his sort of family situation. Um, but to me, it's just extraordinary that someone whose family had suffered so as a result of the Communist Party would then find it attractive to join this body. Um, but he did, and I think he became a true believer, a true adherent. And when he was accepted to university, it was still at a time, it was before the exam system. And so he, when he studied, he was still being trained as, you know, as a Marxist, as a sort of learning about labor and peasant, you know, the worker tradition. And so it wasn't yet that time when you were taking the best and the brightest and bringing them back into the world. It was still very much a time of sort of Chinese communist leadership uh, and the party. So um, I think those early years were formative, but I don't know how you can necessarily pull it apart, the inner psyche of a person mm. to understand what would make someone, you know, either your family has suffered and you rebel against that forever, or your family suffered and somehow you embrace the people that made your family suffer. And of course, yeah. the Communist Party has a long history of purging people and rehabilitating people. We saw that with his father. We saw that with, with, uh, with, Deng, with, with, with Deng Xiaoping. Um, one of the things that Xi Jinping identified, and I remember from my time there, there was a great battle for the soul of the Communist Party. Um, issues of corruption were front and centre, uh, and the years of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao were almost seen as a lost decade, really, of China. Mm -hmm. To what extent did he see a weakness in the Communist Party? And being a student of history, knows where that weakness potentially leads if you look at what happened in the soviet in the soviet union and what he is doing now is a rehabilitation project of returning the communist party to the centrality of power and and doubling down on that authoritarianism because of what he perceived as the communist party losing its way now i think you're, you're absolutely right and what's interesting about xi one of the sort of few things that we know about him as he was coming up through the party ranks was that corruption was always um, sort of central to his being, that he always thought that, that officials should not use their position uh, for personal economic gain. And so you never heard about Xi, even though he was um, you know, party secretary in some of the most advanced and, and fast growing uh, provinces uh, in the country, you never heard about him as leading economic reform necessarily. He kind of rode the wave but he was always very concerned about corruption. So when he came to power in you know, the end of 2012, uh, he immediately began his anti-corruption campaign and cleaning out the party. Uh, because you're exactly right. He saw the who in one years as you know, the, the party had basically become devoid of any ideological or moral center. Uh, there was the only reason to join the Communist Party was because you saw it as an opportunity to advance yourself politically and economically. 
Uh, and so he sought and has sought to rectify this situation. Um, it's interesting, though, because it's hard to know, you know, even though he's, you know, arrested, as I mentioned, and detained more people every year than the mm. year before, some of the people that he's promoted have then been, you know, caught for corruption and, and uh, like um, uh, the former head of uh, Interpol. Uh, mm -hmm. my way. So you, who knows, you know, what's going on exactly. The corruption is so deeply rooted uh, in society at this point. I think it's very difficult uh, for him to to get at it uh, fully. And I'm trying to get an idea. We're getting a lot of questions in at the moment. We'll try to get to a lot of these because there are some fantastic issues that are being raised here. But trying to get an idea on, on where he sees the party and how he fits in to the history and traditions of the party. Um, there is a case that he is a break from the past. And of course, he has turned on its head the very idea of hide and bide. That was Deng Xiaoping's idea that you hide your power and bide your time. Um, China has arrived now where he seeks to return China to the apex of global power. But I'm wondering, is he really a break from the past or is he just delivering on what Mao and Deng and others sought for China? Deng Xiaoping, I remember in 1989, had said as long as history proves the superiority of the Chinese model, that will be enough. And when I hear people say, you know, Xi Jinping is, is a departure, well, let's not forget that Deng Xiaoping ordered the massacre of his own people by the army. Um, is she, in fact, just finishing the job that his previous leaders had set in train? So um, I think it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, one of the things that Xi Jinping uh, said early on um, and has repeated since is that he views his role as, you know, taking the baton from those who have uh, come before him, mm. uh, building on uh, what others have done, like a relay race, right? But then taking it in, you know, his own direction as well, right? So, so there's an element of certainly seeing himself within the context of, of history and, and the and the leaders who have come before, uh, but also in terms of, of carving his own path forward. And I think that is what he's done. I, I'm not someone who believes that the history of China is, or the future of China, that they are preordained somehow by ideology. I think that who leads can matter significantly. Uh, I think we could have seen that with, you know, Zhao Ziyang and Hu Yaobang, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the mid to late 1980s. Things could have turned out very differently. Uh, I think even today, uh, you could have a different constellation of leaders at the top of the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party right now. Even within the Standing Committee of the Politburo, I think there are probably some pretty significant differences in perspective uh, that could, could realize Chinese ambitions for, quote, greatness, but in a very different way. Hmm. Uh, and if you look again at, at China back in 2010, 2011, before Xi Jinping came to power, and look at the political sort of situation on the ground and the sort of vibrancy of the internet, which had really become almost a virtual political system, right? The kind of connectivity that people had, the calls for reform, for environmental activism. Uh, it was an extraordinary time and a very different China. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that leaders can shape uh, China and that greatness can be defined in very different ways. And, and he's just China in a certain set of, with a certain set of, of, of variables of factors. And Elizabeth, part of defining the country and leading the country is to have a narrative. Um, is that there's, in many ways, a deep crisis of legitimacy in China with the Communist Party. I mean, the deal that it had made with its people was, we'll make you rich, but we won't necessarily make you free. And, you know, they have lifted six, seven hundred million people out of poverty. It has been a remarkable economic transformation over a, a 30 year period. Um, to go from, you know, a sick man of Asia, as was once described, to, by some measures, the biggest economy in the world. Um, but, of course, there are questions of legitimacy when the economy starts to slow. There are tensions in the country. We're seeing what's happening in Hong Kong. There is the independence of Taiwan. There is the harmonisation of the country by force, by locking up people such as the Chinese, uh, by, by Muslim Uyghurs. I I'm just wondering about the narrative of Xi Jinping, particularly around this idea of revenge or historical humiliation. He constantly mm. talks about the 100 years of humiliation from the 1840s to the 1940s, the Opium War to the Communist Party Revolution. Uh, how, how deep does that go? How much does that bite? How much do Chinese people buy into this idea of a national humiliation narrative and how far can that take you? 
So I think at, at this point, there's a kind of interesting dichotomy in some ways, because, you know, it used to be back, and I'm sure you remember this as well in the 1990s, and even through the mid 2000s, when you would meet with a Chinese official or a delegation, they would begin, every statement would be prepared, and it would start with, we have suffered 100 yes. years of humiliation, but no matter who you're meeting with, this is what you would get out of them at the outset. I don't know what it was supposed to make you feel guilty or something. I'm not really sure what the purpose was, but but that stopped at some point in the in the mid 2000s, and then I started to get how is the United States going to deal with the rise of China, right? And then then that sort of the the entire narrative changed. I think that the but they've all been schooled in the humiliation, you know, language and and the culture and that narrative, and it's real. I mean, you know, it was a time when China was occupied essentially by foreign powers and, you know, and was invaded. Mm. Uh, so I think it's, it, there's a real sense of that. And it's something that um, Xi Jinping can draw upon, uh, for example, with regard to the United States and efforts to contain China. Uh, so that brings back those kinds of memories. Um, uh, but at the same time, he doesn't want to drill too far down on that. And there's also this great pride, right? And this sense that China has arrived and so somehow you have to just tap into that humiliation narrative when it suits your purpose. But really what Xi Jinping is about is about reclaiming that centrality for China on the global stage. Uh, so one day I think the humiliation narrative will basically be over, but for now it still serves a little bit of a purpose. Uh, and, and let's look at that central stage. If we, if we look at what the China dream means within China, uh, uh, rehabilitation and return to centrality of the Communist Party, uh, harmony and harmony by force, an emphasis on, <laughs> on, on territorial sovereignty, and we're seeing that throughout you know, the clashes with India on the border, the South China Sea, Taiwanese independence, Hong Kong, one party, two systems, all of those things. What does it mean for the world, the China dream? What does it mean for the globe? You know, it, it could mean something very good. Uh, it could mean that we have another country that is interested in leading on the global stage, that is interested in finding common ground and forging consensus and in assuming a level of responsibility, right? Wearing the mantle of great power status. Um, I don't think that's where uh, China is yet. I think mm. Xi Jinping has made claims uh, to wear the mantle, you know, talking well, he, about- He said that at Davos, didn't he? He said that right, you know, exactly, they were the great right? champions of globalization. Yeah, exactly, yeah. we're a champion of globalization. You know, I was like, what champion of globalization? You don't allow for the free flow of capital, the free flow of information. I'm not sure what, glo it's globalization with Chinese characteristics, which means, you know, globalization not, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they said, you know, big defender of climate change, and we've seen Chinese CO2 emissions increase every year, uh, you know, for the past three years. Um, so I don't think China is quite there yet. I think it, it wants the rights of great power status without necessarily assuming the responsibilities. Um, so I think that's one sort of challenge that we have with China on the global stage. I think the other big challenge is that um, it is really right now a destabilizing force in many respects. And uh, as you, you know, have raised, the issue of sovereignty, you know, what it's done in Hong Kong uh, with the new national security law, um, you know, threatening maneuvers with Taiwan, obviously the enormously assertive policy in the South China Sea that has, I think, really begun to lead to the co coalition, now the coalescence of um, all of the other claimants uh, together in opposition uh, to, to China. We have the Belt and Road Initiative, mm. which is not merely, you know, sort of an economic development program, but has everything to do now with Chinese security initiatives, you know, the base in Djibouti. I think there will be more bases to come uh, with political capacity building, training other countries on, you know, how to, you know, manage the internet um, and sort of exporting Chinese values in that way. Uh, and then China and the United Nations. And I think we saw to some extent, um, mm. and I don't say this lightly, but I do think we saw to some extent the influence of China Mm -hmm. uh, in the World Health Organization, in the WHO's reluctance, right, to get out ahead of the pandemic, to criticize China for its lack of transparency, to encourage the world to take, you know, strong action, you know, up front. Um, I think it was reluctant uh, to do that uh, because of Chinese influence. And China is a very important actor in the United Nations. So I think in, in many respects, 
the way that China has played out on the international stage, at least at this moment, um, has been quite challenging uh, for much of the globe. There's a lot to unpack there. I want to get to, a, to the US-China relationship. I want to get to coronavirus, and you've had something to say about that in articles that you've written about what that means for Xi Jinping and for, for China. But I just want to just push forward again a little bit on this idea of how China sees its place in the world and to what extent China can remake the world in its image. You mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, and that is as much about expansive power as it is about infrastructure and, in, and investment. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, we saw in something very interesting recently with the UN Human Rights Council vote on the Chinese uh, laws in Hong Kong, the security laws supporting those laws. We're seeing countries in Africa, Rwanda is an example, where countries are seeking to emulate what is seen as a, a China model, an authoritarian capitalist model. We know that China is increasing its influence in the Pacific in a, in a range of ways, and you raise the possibility of further bases, and that's one area that's been mooted as a, as a base for, for China as well. To what extent are we already seeing China's, uh, what China means and what Xi Jinping means by globalization? And to what extent is that model, if it is indeed a different model that challenges a Washington consensus, is durable and something that can be successfully transplanted, um, successfully exported? So um, this is actually a very big debate within the United States, uh, within the sort of China community about whether or not China is exporting its model. And, and I come down on the side that, that China is exporting at least elements of its model. It's not out there exporting communism the way that Mao Zedong did. It's not preaching revolution, communist revolution, but it is certainly exporting elements of authoritarianism. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, exporting, you know, doing political capacity building in Tanzania or Uganda. How do you develop your, you know, um, Internet governance laws? Right. How do you do uh, real time censorship of the Internet? How do you control the media and civil society? So it is there uh, educating officials and working with officials in other countries uh, to, to have them develop laws and regulations uh, that are modeled on China's. Uh, and so Tanzania, for example, um, and one other, and I don't want to say which one it was because now I'm not sure whether it was Kenya or Uganda, modeled its its um, uh, internet governance law on that mm. of China, cybersecurity law on that of China. So uh, it's definitely happening. I, I think there's there's no doubt. It, to some extent, it's a very attractive model for leaders who are already inclined toward authoritarianism, uh, right? Why not? Um, mm. And, and you, then you can have the support of China as well, right? Because China is going to be in there, not only educating and training officials, but you know, providing uh, media content, right? As you know, Huawei now provides the telecommunications 4G mm. infrastructure for 80% of Africa, right? Star Times TV uh, is there pumping, you know, Chinese television content uh, throughout Africa. So Xiaomi phone is there. So. You know, Chinese companies got in there in the early and mid 2000s. And so all of them are, you know, sort of spread throughout uh, the continent and have to be responsive to the Chinese government at this point. So, um, you know, even if they had at some point a desire to be reasonably independent uh, at this point, there's there's no way that they are not being responsive to the demands of Xi Jinping and the Communist Party. So there are many tools at Xi Jinping's disposal is the point I'm trying to make in terms of spreading Chinese uh, influence, uh, political influence. And there is direct influence. And then there is just the transactional costs and benefits of, of, of having to live with a big China in the world. One of the costs is that it's broadly been good for the for global economy. It's become an engine of growth and certainly for Australia in particular. Um, yeah. helped maintain Australia's growth throughout the, the worst of the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and, and so on. Um, but but I, I'm just interested as well in, in something you raised there about Huawei, um, which is getting a lot of attention, Australia or other parts of, of the world, and this technology war, if, if you like. With the centrality of the Chinese Communist Party in every aspect of life, and that difficulty in being able to separate what is a private sphere from a public sphere, with a, such a, a, a company such as Huawei and the sensitivity of information and technology, how do you see that? And it, is, it, is it, in your view, an arm of the Communist Party? Our country's right to be concerned about its, its, its involvement in rollout of things like 5G, where Australia clearly uh, has, has drawn a line, as have others. How do you view that? 
Right. Yeah, I mean, Australia was one of the first. In fact, you were ahead of the United States uh, in terms of deciding not to, to use Huawei uh, 5G. So, um, I mean, I do think we have to be concerned. Look, Xi Jinping has called Huawei a national champion. We've seen that the Chinese, you know, diplomatic corps has threatened countries like the UK, you know, if they reject Huawei from their telecommunications infrastructure. That is not the way that a capitalist country behaves, a democracy behaves. I mean, the United States does not threaten a country if they decide to go with Airbus over Boeing. <laughs> it's not how we behave. And so there's no doubt in my mind that Chinese technology companies uh, are, look, the Chinese Communist Party has party cells in all these companies, right? We know with tech companies in particular uh, in Hangzhou that government officials were sent in, scores of them were sent into the Chinese technology companies there uh, in order to ensure that the needs of the government were aligned with the practices uh, or of the of the companies, or the company's practices aligned with the needs of the government. So it's really become incumbent at this point on the Chinese companies to be able to prove to the rest of the world that they can be independent. And we see this now with TikTok, for example, which is this enormously popular, creative, you know, breakthrough, really, you know, social media uh, app in a way, I guess, you know, video sharing uh, app. Um, and countries around the world are quite concerned about the uh, ability of TikTok to access users' information, um, you know, to use its algorithm to sort of push certain narratives from the Chinese Communist Party, the fact that it's censored, uh, you know, information around Tiananmen and, and other uh, issues that are sensitive to the Chinese Communist Party. So, you know, how does TikTok then have a global reach in the world of advanced, you know, market democracies if it's viewed as essentially pushing the interests of the CCP. It's mm. very, very difficult. And that's why I'll make the, sorry, going on a little bit long, make the last point, which I think is interesting that, you know, at the two sessions, which is the meeting of the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is the advisory mm. body to the National People's Congress, um, this past May, uh, Robin Lee, who is the head of Baidu, put forward a, a proposal that said, which is, for people who don't know, Baidu is this, has a search engine, you know, kind of like a Google of, of China, um, put forth a proposal that said that the information that was collected from the Chinese citizens during the pandemic, uh, that, that the people would have an opt out, right? So that the Chinese government can't just go and collect information. Um, you know, local officials were starting to say, we should be able to track people, but how much are they drinking? How much are they walking? All of this inf personal information from the Chinese people to develop like a health score for, for individuals. Mm -hmm. So I think at that point, you know, there are issues of privacy that the Chinese people themselves are becoming concerned about. And I think that in some ways is the greatest hope for reform in China and for many market democracies and China to come back together is the pressure that's gonna emanate from within the Chinese populace itself uh, to move in directions and to develop norms and values that are more aligned with those of advanced industrial that's, that, that, that's That's really fascinating because China, you know, we know, and you've written about this in your book, um, you know, for a country that likes to present an image of, of harmony and centralized communist party control, you know, that old saying of being far from the emperor, we know that the further you get from Beijing, there is much more unrest. There are lots of protests every single day. Um, issues such as the environment, healthcare, um, you know, care for the elderly. Um, all of these things are, are such such deep-seated issues inside the country. Uh, this, this clash between um, the desire for greater freedoms that we see, I suppose, most spectacularly in Hong Kong and that authoritarian control, does that lead to a fragility? I know that Susan Shirk had written a terrific book some years ago, The, the, the yeah. Fragile Superpower. To exactly. what extent do you see a fragility? And does, does Xi Jinping meet that fragility with greater force, greater authoritarianism? I think it's clear that that is the only way that he knows how to address that core weakness, right? Otherwise, you don't lock up more than a million of your own people, right? The Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang, right? Mm -hmm. If you're confident of your legitimacy, 
you don't need to control your people uh, in this way, right? You don't need to repress them in this way. You can manage a degree of dissent, uh, of open commentary, uh, an open media. Uh, it's those who are not confident in their legitimacy that cannot manage uh, that process. Uh, so I think there's no doubt that there's a, a degree of fragility. And, and the, what's interesting is that one of the things that was revealed by the pandemic in the early stages was that you saw this burst of civil society activism uh, the kind of which we hadn't seen since, you know, 2011 and 2012, pre Xi Jinping, where, you know, citizens, journalists were, you know, trying to ensure that they were getting accurate information. You know, journalists were flooding into Wuhan, questioning the government's narrative. You know, people were communicating uh, across the internet, providing, you know, trusted platforms for information. You had lawyers banding together at one point uh, to help victims uh, of the COVID-19, their families, you know, sue on their behalf. You had people criticizing Xi Jinping, right? Ran Zhichang, the billionaire who's now been arrested and is, is going to be prosecuted, you know, criticizing Xi Jinping very directly and lawyers criticizing Xi Jinping and the Communist Party. So there was this moment, you know, of maybe a month where you had all of this openness that was very reminiscent uh, of the pre sheet period. And I think what it tells us is that just because we don't see this anymore mm -hmm. on a daily basis doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. You know, it doesn't what, mean what, that what was fascinating at that period too, Elizabeth, um, and you raised this in an article you wrote for Foreign Affairs, where you talked about what COVID-19 may mean for Xi Jinping. He disappeared <laughs> at the height of that crisis for a period as well. Um, reflect on that. And where China's at now, has he emerged from this, though? Because he can say, look, we defeated this. He describes this as a people's war and we won this war and the yeah. Communist Party won this war. Has he emerged from it, in fact, stronger, though? Well, I would say this. I think the story of COVID-19, the pandemic, is not over yet. Right. We we don't have the bookends. We don't have either uh, understanding of the origins of the virus. Right. Which is something that Australia has been out front of, you know, calling for investigation. And we don't have a vaccine. So that means that the pandemic continues to evolve and the story of the pandemic continues to evolve. And even in China, we still have outbreaks happening. Uh, even though they have taken very strong measures uh, to control the pandemic. I think, you know, what the pandemic did was to illuminate the very nature of Chinese governance, its strengths, its weaknesses, you know, its mobilization strengths, right? Its ability to quarantine, you know, tens of millions of people at once, its ability to, you know, produce massive amounts of PPE in a very short time uh, to create those quarantine centers. You know, that's a strength of the mm -hmm. Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but it also revealed the weakness, right? The very fact that it is repressive and lacks transparency is what allowed the virus to spread in the beginning, right? To spread within China and then, you know, ultimately to spread outside of China as well. Um, you know, the, the fact that they had a diplomatic moment where they could extend themselves and, and you know, after they had beaten down the worst of it uh, to, to go out and provide uh, the PPE for the rest of the world, and then they totally undermined it themselves with their wolf warrior diplomacy, demanding gratitude, uh, you know, and saying, yes, if you're going to ask for, you know, an investigation, actually, we're going to, you know, ban your beef and, you know, put tariffs on your barley, right? So I, I think it really showed, you know, both what can work in China and what really doesn't work. Um, and so for Xi Jinping, has he come out stronger or weaker? I think um, those countries that were predisposed to be concerned about China, concerned about its lack of transparency, about its bullying nature, I think that the pandemic has only heightened their concern. Uh, I think those countries that have been more embracing of China, they look and they see a country that has managed the pandemic certainly better than the United States, right, mm -hmm. which is sort of the comparative element to all of this. Um, and, and they want China to, to win in this. They want it to come out uh, well. Uh, and so they create a different narrative. So I think that Xi Jinping hasn't won the global narrative, but I think certainly in some segments of the world society, yes, China has been very effective. To what extent? Uh, well, we, we can accept that the coronavirus crisis has accelerated, I think, tensions that were already there. To what extent has that now really brought front and centre this idea 
of a new Cold War. Is that where we're at right now? So this is another big debate here in the United States, as you might imagine. You know, are China and the United States in a new Cold War? Uh, I would say if, if we're not in it, we are on the precipice. <laughs> we're edging very close uh, to it. I think um, there is a sense of a real ideological battle underway. Obviously, we have a strong uh, economic uh, you know, set of concerns um, and this push toward decoupling uh, at this point. Uh, and in terms of the security, obviously, we you know, have the South China Sea and, and we have Taiwan and, and more broadly, what seems to be emerging is, you know, we have five eyes and we've got NATO and we've got, you know, our various uh, bilateral uh, alliances, military alliances in Asia. But, um, but China, too, you know, has been doing a lot of its own building up of military relationships. And even though they don't, China doesn't call it formal alliances, you know, parts of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm -hmm. its relationship with Russia, this new Pakistan, right? Certainly Pakistan, its new comprehensive partnership with Iran. We'll have to wait to see what that, you know, includes. So I think um, we're beginning to see a, a, a sense that the world is dividing. And, um, you know, I think there are countries like Australia that, that, and most countries probably are not interested in that divide, right? Because as you said at the outset, uh, you know, China's economy helped Australia weather uh, the global financial crisis beautifully, right? All of the natural resources that uh, you know, Australia sends uh, to China, sells to China. Um, so nobody wants to be, you know, not engaged with this engine of global economic growth. Uh, but at some point, I think countries also have to decide, you know, at what price, you know, our values, at what price is security. Uh, and is that what we're seeing with Australia and the United States? The Australian Foreign Minister and Defence Minister have just concluded meetings in the US um, with US officials. We've certainly seen a hardening of rhetoric from the US and Australia, particularly around the South China Sea, not recognising China's legal claim, but China's alleged legal claim to the South China Sea. Uh, in terms of the balance of those interests versus values, are we seeing increasingly uh, countries like Australia um, uh, prioritising values, security over, say, economic interests. In the if choices are being made, are we seeing those choices, in fact, now being made? Well, I would have to say you are in a better position to answer that than than I am. I can tell you what it looks like from the outside, mm. which is yes, I think that is a bit the way it looks like, and in part, I think that's a function also of the fact that Australia, probably even more than the United States, has. Um, had to deal with Chinese influence operations within, you know, within your own, you know, borders, right? So concerns over influence within the political system, in universities, et cetera. So I think that also tends to raise the threat level, right? When you feel as though a foreign power is somehow uh, trying to shape your politics, I think that that's, you know, in the massive uh, cyber attack that Australia uh, endured recently, um, I, I think that tends to, to raise uh, the temperature in the relationship and, and to place a, a greater primacy on things like values and security over economics, even though, of course, you know, China is your largest trading partner, but we are your largest investor. So, mm, you know, mm, mm. <laughs> don't forget that. Well, I, I'm just wondering, in terms of a Cold War and who, who started it, if there's a chicken and egg, um, what came first? We saw in 2017 a, a shift um, in the posture of the United States to declare China a strategic competitor um, and to identify in a strategic white paper that China and, and Russia were the great challenges or threats, um, greater even than, than terrorism um, at that point. Uh, and, and then we followed that in 2018-19 with a, a trade war, um, the increasing rhetoric now, mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you disbelieve and verify, um, to, to quote, uh, Mike Pompeo, that, that, you know, there has been a significant shift. Did that precipitate the assertiveness of China or did China's increasing assertiveness uh, lead to the US position of declaring it a strategic competitor and starting to push back harder? Right. So I think if, if you're looking for which country is responsible for, quote, the Cold War, it's probably the United States that made that a new strategic determination, uh, a new strategic assessment. But if you're looking for who laid the foundations for it, I would say it's China. 
Uh, I think what we've seen in the United States is really a shift from you know, our traditional policy of engage but hedge, right? a belief that we should focus on trying to bring China into the international community, that by doing that, by helping China you know, uh, engage in the structures and institutions, that it would develop the norms, both at the international level, but also that it would begin to liberalize politically and economically at home. Um, that, and then we would hedge against that if it didn't, if it went awry, that we would still, you know, have our allies and other things. So there's, there's a hedge. But, but I think at a certain point, the United States woke up and the point, I think, began during the Obama administration, but really came into full bloom with the Trump administration. We looked around and said, you know what, this actually isn't working that well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Xi Jinping has moved this country in such a, a radically different direction from the one that engagement was trying to, to encourage, that engagement wasn't really justified uh, in the same way. And so now, I, I, the way I put it is we have a, a policy of compete, counter, and contain. Um, yeah. And that's really the approach that the United States is taking. And what the United States has done, I think, in the past three years with the Trump administration, and I think actually it's been really important, is to look across every single domain, political, economic, security, and every single issue and call China out. Mm. And, and, and just, just on that, Elizabeth, um, let's look at the Trump factor. Uh, Barack Obama was criticised by some uh, for not being assertive enough and not pushing back enough. And even critics of Donald Trump have said he has been right to confront China a lot more. What's your assessment thus far of, of his handling of this? So I actually don't see Donald Trump as the architect of, of our China policy. I think Donald Trump, his President Trump, his policy was really come in, he had two major issues, North Korea and trade. And those continue to be his issues. And as what's come out of the Bolton book, you know, John Bolton mm -hmm. book, uh, that demonstrates that he doesn't care about, you know, Uyghurs Uyghur, and Xinjiang. Yeah. He doesn't care about Taiwan, really. These are not issues that engage him, right? We know the way that he treats our allies, which is, you know, not well. Uh, he views alliances and multilateral arrangements as burdens, really. Uh, so I don't view our policy as emanating from Donald Trump. I view it as emanating from a level below Donald Trump, from people originally like Secretary Mattis and Tillerson, who actually, in many respects, it was a kind of, rebalance, Obama kind of rebalance on steroids. Um, and they are much more multilateral and internationalist than I think uh, many people give the US credit for because of the way that President Trump speaks. Um, but they are the ones who have really looked across uh, each of these areas. And our Congress, which frankly has always taken issues of human rights um, and has taken Hong Kong, the Uyghur issue, and in particular Taiwan, um, taking it very, very seriously. And so this is a moment at which you have a great alignment between Congress <clears throat> and the administration, but it's the administration below the level of mm. President Trump. He signs but, off on it, but he's not the architect. So, so to that extent, if there was a change in presidency this year, and some have interpreted the increased rhetoric as being part of, a, of, of, of the politics of an election year, but if there was a change in a Biden presidency, that that bipartisan approach when it comes to pushing back against China would continue. How do you see that under Joe Biden, if indeed? Yeah, became I, I think I think it would continue. I think there will be some differences, though. I think um, the rhetoric would probably be tamped down a little bit. I, I don't think you you wouldn't have the calls. I don't believe to the Chinese people, you know, to rise up against the Chinese Communist Party and this incessant effort to separate out the government from the people. Um, I think uh, you would have a little bit more of an effort to find some areas of common ground. I don't think we'd go back to the Obama era where uh, there'd be a sense that we could, you know, we'd be willing to trade out something on the South China Sea because we're working on climate change. Um, I think we continue to push forward on the South China Sea and, and across all these different areas. But I do think we get back in climate change. We try to find our way back into some form of the, China, the comprehensive um, What's it now? It's the uh, CPTPP, mm -hmm. uh, the old TPP. I think we we try to get back into multilateral arrangements, work, you know, in a better way with our allies. Uh, but I do think overall that the orientation of the United States toward China 
uh, would remain largely the same. And if that orientation continues, are we then on a trajectory to something much worse? And some have talked about a Thucydides trap, and that's been thrown around this idea of a of a rising power versus a waning power. If indeed you see the US as a waning power, and that ultimately leading to conflict, there are flashpoints right across the region: the South China Sea, the the conflicts between India and China on their border, Japan and China, you know, Senkaku Diaoyu Islands that they've been areas, contested areas as well. Uh, what is the trajectory, given what you've outlined about increasing assertiveness, China's export of a new model, a division of the world with the Shanghai Cooperation Group and so on, uh, and, and a bipartisan approach in the US that doesn't believe you can just trade your way out of these things with China? There must be red lines, if you like, there must be pushback. Where does that leave us? I mean, it, I think it leaves us in a, in a challenging place. Um, but I also think, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Thucydides trap uh, I, idea. Again, I, I think leaders matter. But also, I think what we're engaged in is, is not just a, it's not a rising power, status quo power challenge. What it is, it's, it's a normative battle, right? It's, it's a battle around freedom of navigation and mm. free trade and human rights and good governance. And to that extent, it's not really about the United States. I think that's something that, you know, the free and open Indo-Pacific really recognizes, right? So that's Australia, Japan, India, the United States is sort of the, the original quad. And this was really Prime Minister Abe's idea initially. Um, it, this is about norms and values. And, and so I think to the extent that that is the uh, foundation for, uh, you know, the engagement of China, um, I think we're much stronger, and, and I don't. I don't think it's just this this rising power, status quo mm. power. You know, that's the way everybody frames it all the time. Uh, and so I, I try to take a step back and think about it in a slightly different way conceptually, um, because I think once you do that, then um, the countries that support those values become much stronger. Uh, and I think one of the important things that we've seen happen, for example, is this new interparliamentary group. Of, of you know, based on democracies, and Australia is a member, United States is a member, several countries in Europe are members, um, and I think so. You're beginning to forge connections, um, not just you know, president to president or prime minister, but more broadly, uh, you know, through the parliaments and the congresses and things. I think it's very important, um, and it reinforces that sense that uh, you know, all the democracies, all these advanced uh, you know, democratic uh, countries uh, have the same thing at stake in this. But there, there are so many tripwires, aren't there? Um, and we've seen how quickly things can can escalate. Um, tit for tat arrests, Canada and the United States, for instance, we've seen things like that play out. Um, Huawei, we've already talked about. Um, issues of human rights. You know, the Chinese security law in Hong Kong that can reach beyond China's borders if necessary. Um, the weaker situation that you mentioned. And then, of course, there are the defensive issues and, and strategic and territorial issues in play. Is the, is the risk that we lose the, the diplomatic architecture, if you like, the capacity to be able to, to speak through these things, to negotiate these things, and that a mistake, a misadventure, an accident could tip things over into crisis and escalation very, very quickly? No, I mean, you're absolutely right. And so I would say if, if there is a weakness um, in the Trump administration approach, aside from President Trump himself, if there's a weakness... Um, I think it's it's that there is no um, diplomatic engagement with China, and that there is no um, no effort to find common ground on one or two or three issues. And I do think this is important um, because that is the type of bridge building that will help to uh, you know keep the relationship from you know continuing to deteriorate and ending up in that kind of um, you know sort of. Uh, potential for, you know, a small accident to turn into a much bigger, you know, conflagration. Uh, and so I think that, that again, I believe will change with the new administration. I think there will be a, the sort of diplomatic infrastructure will be rebuilt uh, between the two countries. I think that will be helpful. Um, I think it's also important when you're looking at something like Xinjiang and the Uyghur situation, I think it really does matter who is calling China out. And I think China finds it very easy at this point to dismiss the United States, probably to dismiss Australia, to dismiss the UK. It would not find it as easy to dismiss 
you know, a collection of, um, you know, Muslim countries. If they mm. were to stand up and say, your behavior in Xinjiang that doesn't is happen. atrocious. It, it, it hasn't happened. I mean, we've had, you know, individuals at various points in time. I think Erdogan said one thing once and, um, you know, Mahathir maybe said one thing once, but it hasn't happened in a significant way. But that also speaks to our abilities, right, to reach out to other kinds of partners to engage them in this in this discussion. And I think um, that has not been a strength of the United States, certainly. So um, it, I think we have to look at the issues issue by issue uh, and determine, you know, who will have a voice with China on this particular issue. It's kind of like in climate change, right? It wasn't simply about President Obama reaching out to President Xi Jinping and saying, come join me to forge this new agreement uh, and jumpstart negotiations. It was the fact that small island nations stood up and told China, you need to do something because you are going to cause the extinction of us. So I think we've got to think in, in somewhat more sophisticated terms and holistically globally and that, about how to bring pressure to bear on China. That's something that Henry Kissinger had identified, that there is one thing in sort of confrontation, but there needs to be a strategy. And he identified perhaps a lack of, of strategy around this. But where does that put a country like Australia, uh, which is we've discussed, is at a, a hinge point here and has close ties with the United States and, uh, and China, a middle power within the Asia Pacific region, um, where does that put Australia in its role potentially in being able to bridge to bridge that divide? Well, uh, you know, if Australia can bridge the divide, I think it would be terrific. Um, I'm not sure Australia at this moment is in that position. It seems to me Australia is also more interested in ensuring that China doesn't intrude too much in its own backyard and Pacific Islands and other places. Mm -hmm and has its own sort of ambitions as a middle power to be a kind of regional power, as it should. Um, and the steps that I think Australia has taken around Huawei, for example, around you know foreign interference now on the South China Sea, again, suggests to me that it, it's not quite caught in the middle between the United States and China, that it does lean a little bit more toward the United States. But of course, it's a decision every country is gonna have to make for itself. Um, and as I said, you are probably in a better position than, than I am uh, to say something about how you think Australia is going to navigate this. Uh, one of the, the things you touched on with the China dream is that, you know, yes, you, re, you, know, you, you centralize Communist Party power, you continue to build the economy, uh, create harmony in the society, but you build a military that can, and as Xi Jinping has said, fight and win a war. Um, where is China now? in terms of its capacity to deliver on that. Uh, we know that it is, you know, looking at if there was a conflict, it would be territorial and strategic. It wouldn't necessarily be the type of conflict where, you know, we've seen in other parts of the world. But where do you assess its fighting capacity and its military development right now? So, I mean, I think um, many people will say that the greatest um, you know, risk is in the South China Sea. And I, and I do think that that's an issue. My greater concern when it comes to Chinese military capabilities, which are, you know, which have under Xi Jinping become, you know, much greater, not just in terms of the hardware, but in terms of, you know, he has completely restructured the military, modeled it on the United States and other uh, advanced, uh, you know, militaries. Um, uh, he's, you know, weeded out a lot of the corrupt military officials. Uh, so I think, you know, in the United States, we look at and think he's really undertaken a very significant reform and upgrade of the Chinese military over the past, you know, almost eight years now. But I'm most concerned about Taiwan. Uh, mm. And I think, um, you know, Taiwan uh, for Xi Jinping, you know, he said we do not, um, you know, renounce the potential to use force uh, with regard to Taiwan. Uh, he's been adopted a number of very well, coercive... They, they, they've changed their language, isn't it? It's no longer using the language right. of peaceful reunification. Peaceful is right. gone. It is reunification. That's right. That's right. Um, and we saw during the pandemic that there was a little debate that broke out uh, among some retired military officials and uh, foreign policy analysts about whether the time was ripe to invade Taiwan. Uh, I think that's concerning. Um, I've had some senior Chinese uh, scholars tell me that Part of the reason that Xi Jinping uh, eliminated the two-term limit on the presidency was because he wanted to ensure that he would be around to, you know, 
basically to, to bring Taiwan back into the mm. fold. So this is a significant priority for him. Uh, and so that's probably where my concern is greatest. And one of the things when I'm talking to people in Washington these days that, that I'm saying is this isn't the time to poke the dragon, right? Because it will breathe and Taiwan will be engulfed in flames. And so um, better to let China think that things are moving in the right direction while you continue to you know, support Taiwan and advance the relationship, enhance the bilateral relationship, but don't pass new legislation that is simply going to inflame tensions. Uh, it's not gonna deliver the result you want, even if it makes you feel good in the moment. So um, looking at what happened to Hong Kong, I think this is not the right time uh, to push uh, on the Taiwan front. And we can push quietly, but I don't think we should be you know, loud about this. We just have about five minutes left, but there's a couple of things I wanted to sort of get to in a, in a big picture sense. And that is, do we accept the, um, the, the, the uninterrupted trajectory of China's emergence as a great power? Do we accept that it continues to grow? Do we accept that it continues to push its influence around the world? Um, it's getting older. There is a demographic time bomb there. An older population means a less productive population. Its, its economy was already slowing before the coronavirus. We get to see how that fully plays out as well. Um, holding the country together is incredibly difficult. And history tells us that you don't become a middle income country. You don't become a wealthy country and also deny freedoms or, or without sort of becoming more politically liberal. How do you see that, that trajectory? Do you accept, I mean, I know there's the old line about the collapse of China and we haven't seen that. It may not be a collapse, but it may be a, 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 more, a slower sort of erosion. How do you see it? Right, I'm very glad I didn't write that book called The Collapse of China. <laughs> Gordon Chang is still talking about it 30 years later. I, know, I, know, I, know, I, know, I just, I just relieved. <laughs> um, you know, look, I think um, it's it's the gazillion dollar question at this point. The trillion dollar question is in what's going to happen to China. I, there are a number of of um, structural weaknesses. You pointed to several of them: the demographics, the slowing economy. Xi Jinping had to forego you know, his um, meeting his pledge of doubling the income by 2020 because of the slowdown in the economy and the pandemic. Li Keqiang revealed, you know, 600 million people living on less than $140 per month, which, you know, shocked apparently uh, many, many Chinese. They had no idea that was the situation. That means Xi Jinping's not going to realize his, you know, pledge to eliminate poverty uh, by 2020 either. Um, there are always a lot of problems. Um, I think for me, I, I tend to think the creative space, so it's a it's a combination of intellectuals and, and creative people who are being stifled uh, by the party's intrusion and repression, uh, people who are being left behind uh, in the Chinese economic miracle, and there'll be more of them now that the economy is, is slowing. Uh, and then what really matters, at least in my opinion, is what's happening within the elite and how much pushback there can be uh, against Xi Jinping, against his, you know, overreach on the global stage and his incredibly repressive policies at home, you know, when does it get to a point when the leaders say, like they did with Mao Zedong after uh, the Great Leap Forward, you know, you've, you've moved us too far in the wrong direction, time to take a step back, and you're going to take a step back. Maybe he's not ousted, but he's moved to the second are we, line. Are we seeing signs of, of that? Um, I, I know from having lived there, you talk about, you know, to imagine that China is devoid of politics is wrong. It's it's very political. And inside the Communist Party, there are lots of different opinions. It's very robust. Are you starting to see some of that now, the questioning of his future and his leadership? Well, I think we definitely saw it a year and a half ago. And, and the question is, you know, what's happening now? I think there's clearly some debate going on in the economic front between Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping. And how much you know that extends into other areas? You know, I don't know, um, but I but I think we would not be wise, as I said about the you know sort of burst of civil society activism. We would not be wise to assume that just because we can't see it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, and so we need to look for those small signals of of change, of adaptation in policy that would suggest that maybe. Um, he's being reined in a little bit. Mm. And just, just a final thought. I mean, I was interested in the book that Kishore Mababani wrote recently saying, has China won? Uh, and, and this idea of, a, of an idea, and much of this is ideological. Freedom House now 
says that, you know, we had 13 years of declining democracy around the world. You look at the United States, politically polarised, brought to its knees by coronavirus. Um, uh, we're seeing, you know, protests on the streets and so on there. Uh, China also would say, look, we're a big power. We deserve a seat at the table. Why does Europe and the United States dominate the World Bank and the IMF and other international institutions? Uh, in terms of where we're at right now, who has the upper hand? Oh, I mean, I think the United States and the democracies of the world have the upper hand. Uh, I mean, China uh, is seeking uh, greater legitimacy. Its economy is slowing. Um, it's going to have to pull back on its belt and road a little bit. Its policies are earning it, you know, greater concern globally, you know, pushback in the South China Sea. Um, it's making gains in places like Hong Kong but uh, at great expense to, I think, its global standing. So, um, you know, doesn't mean that China doesn't continue to pose a very significant challenge, uh, but I've been, frankly, reassured by the extent to which countries around the world, democracies around the world, are beginning to come together to recognize the nature of the Chinese challenge and to try to think creatively about how to address it and to stand together. Elizabeth, we could have spoken all day. Um, I've been a great fan of your work for many years and uh, it's been fantastic to be able to talk to you today. A lot of engagement online, lots of great questions and, uh, and ideas that we've been able to incorporate in this discussion. Again, apologies to everyone if we can't get to every single issue you'd like to have covered, but I think we've, uh, we've covered a fair bit of the waterfront. Um, Elizabeth, a, a real pleasure. All the best. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Sam. It was great.